as artists, it's you know you it, it's your responsibility to uh, or part of your necessity to sort of respond to the world around you. Block Nine was founded, and NYC Down Life was founded on a, a group of like-minded people um, wanting to create something from nothing. Before the download, I didn't go, I'd never been to Glastonbury. I had no desire to go to Glastonbury. I kind of felt that um, Glastonbury and festivals were very kind of straight, macho, rocky kind of places. One of the most pivotal places for me becoming comfortable as a gay man and finding my people. The creative sophistication, the stagecraft is just so phenomenal. It's interesting to see some of the ideas in electronic music uh, flushed out into actual spaces that you can enter. One of the very few people who are born out of that free party era that still maintain a bit of political activism in what they do. It's bringing this uh, sci-fi element that a lot of artists on the fringe have been working with. Sci-fi is reality, you know. Block 9 is a real, is a hom homage to electronic music, past, present, future. It was MRC Download really in, in 2007 that sort of kick-started it all. been going to Glastonbury since 12 or 13 and going to the illegal raves, the free raves outside the festival perimeter. Ended up buying a bus and buying a sound system and um, travelling around doing illegal raves, warehouse parties and stuff. That was how I ended up living with the people that ran Las Vegas, which is the original naughty corner area in the southeast corner. Well, Roy fell out with Glastonbury Festival and then there was a, a void where Las Vegas used to be. Some of the people that were involved with Las Vegas saw that there was like a land grab about to happen. We decided that we, we, we wanted to do like a gay venue at Glastonbury because there was, there was nothing else of that. Joe Rush from the Mutoid Waste Company had proposed a new late night area as part of Theatre and Circus uh, called Trash City and, um, and the NYC Download. We proposed that the NYC Download could be part of that and they found uh, a couple of grand for us as a budget which we spent on a, on a removals lorry and some materials and we just got a whole bunch of friends to come down and play records and help us to build a set. Everything was built from scratch that first year. It was such a success from the from the get-go that we sort of, sort, sort of thought we, we, we need to kind of formalise this arrangement uh, and uh, and that's how Block 9 started. So the NYC download came first and then, and then Block 9. We rocked up at the farm with a scrappy old rolled up bit of paper with a sketch on that Steve had done of um, a Lower East Side tenement with uh, an alleyway in front of it and we slapped the sketch down on the kitchen table and said we want to build a gay bar, Michael. And he, he said yeah, he and we shook hands and he wrote a check and that was about it. Uh, it was, yeah, all of our sort of um, agreements with Glastonbury have been done in that sort of manner ever since. You know, they're done on goodwill and faith and, uh, and normally a handshake over the kitchen table and a cup of tea. Crazy bitches sitting out there talking about, I ain't gonna do that nasty shit, I ain't gonna do that freaky shit. Well, let me tell you something. What you gonna do? Another bitch with. And she will do that shit so swell. His ass ain't coming back on you. If your man wants you to do some nasty gutter butt trifling slutty, hoe is pornographic bullshit. You better get with the motherfucking program, baby. If he wants to stick his dick in your ear, lick your ear. Now here you come out. Download has been coined as being the best club in the world by certain magazines. And I think um, the ingredients to making the best club are great music, obviously, great 
performance troupe who do great shows. And it's not even like they're necessarily the best executed. The gang who are on stage kind of give permission for everyone else to kind of experiment, be free, let go, you know, be crazy. That's always, that's always kind of been the way. Good people, good staff, you want security, all that kind of stuff. You know, it's, you, you, want, uh, you want a permissive environment, which isn't about taking photos. Good setup and good drugs. I don't think the intention of the download is to give people who don't go to our clubs our experience. That's not the intention. The intention, as far as I'm concerned, is for us to throw a great party every single night. And if you happen to be lucky enough to get into that party, so be it. But I don't, we're not educating anybody. There's no education going on. You know, it's not, we're not trying to prove or show that this is, this is another way. This is being in a festival, throwing the, throwing the kind of party which we think um, a festival needs because we think we deserve to have that space. And I'm not even gonna say it's a safe space. I think that's the wrong word too. There were kind of three main categories of people that were coming to the NYC down low. There were like, there were gay people who were like, and, and, and alt sort of people who were just, just didn't have any other representation anywhere else. And it was like a, a fucking, you know, like a honeypot to them. Uh, there were loads of girls in there who were having an amazing time on the dance floor which I've seen before in gay clubs, where you know, you know, not necessarily uh, you know queer girls, but girls just going in and going into a club where they're not going to get hassled by loads of blokes. And then there were loads of sort of curious straight boys. I mean, a lot of curious straight boys as well. Uh, lots of quite straight-ish, straight-ish, <laughs> straight uh, rugby shirt wearing kind of straight boys. The first time that I played here, I was walked straight into New York City down low. Um, and I couldn't believe it because it was just so completely insane. It was the muddiest year that they had ever had here, I guess, in history. And it was like the, the, the mud was above the boot line. And I tromped up in there in my boots and I took them off and was suddenly in this insane club that there was a side of beef in front of it, but it wasn't real. And I was so confused. I mean, the stagecraft is so incredible. And obviously all of the dancers are so incredible. And it was just like instant, instant transportation into another world. A lot of gay, well, most queer people just have this like shame that they just are inbuilt, you know, it's like just built into them from a very early age. And, um, you know, there's this kind of funny sort of power shift when you're in there. It's like for once straight people aren't the majority and it's kind of like our space. Gideon sort of said like, you know, going, he went to Glastonbury every year since he was a teenager. Like walking around, there was never any representation. You know, it felt like, it's almost like a metaphor for how it is in the world when you're a teenager growing up gay or whatever, any part of the spectrum. It's like this like feeling alone. So, you know, it's born out of necessity and it's born out of um, like a real need. Queer culture, gay culture is, um, a massive part of the sort of DNA structure of house music. Um, so, you know, that's what happens if you put on the right music and you, 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 you make that music available to the people that that music sort of belongs to, then, you know, amazing stuff happens. And that's the beautiful thing about the NYC Downlow is that, you know, the heritage of house music was born in, in gay clubs in Chicago and New York and and it's you know it's it's really kind of showing that and and showing homage to to that and the and the the fourth the fourth founding fathers and and mothers and you know the pioneers it's it's really bringing that to the people
Genosys um, stands for Generated Oxygen System, a machine basically that performs the same function as a tree. Um, in that, it is um, the idea was that um, uh, human beings have kind of um, have reached the end of their sort of time on the planet, and they've they've uh, rinsed the planet of all, all of its natural resources, and then in a last ditch attempt to sort of save the, the poison planet, um, they've gone out and they've they've created this machine. They've gone out and harvested loads of fresh plants and they're incubating and growing plants inside this um, this machine in order to generate oxygen to sort of, uh, to sort of rejuvenate the, the air. And the machine just so happens to be like a stylish, brutalist, <laughs> concrete and glass <laughs> yeah. sculptural looks like object. A, looks like a sounds technically. But it also talks about the birth of something, you know, genesis um, of something. And, you know, it was about the birth of electronic music and the sort of, and the sort of squelchy kind of groaning noises that that might make. Pretty amazing acid house that gets played on Genesis as well. Sunday nights in Genesis are normally like amazing acid house. Things just look like they sound a certain way, don't they? And the, 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 the sound for Genesis um, was, you know, originally gonna be analog music, um, early digital music. Um, it, the, the sort of scope of, of the DJs that we put on there, the live sets that we put on there is sort of broadened a bit um, over the past few years and it's basically just like really good quality techno. Genesis, I, I feel when that was built, represented a lot more the free party scene or the outdoor kind of sound or experience that I've, I've had or, or Gideon and Steve might have had um, and that kind of side of dance music, it's, it's more of a home for that. The music back then was uh, in a way a voice of rebellion. The actual set in itself is this kind of futuristic, dystopian monolith um, with the, the plants and the DJ booth kind of feeding off each other in some kind of symbiotic uh, life support system. Graphics, are, I mean visuals rather, are pretty mind-blowing with all the video mapping. I mean, it's kind of big structure looming over the dance floor. I don't know how many 20, 30 tonnes of concrete ballast at the back of it to stop it flipping over. Playing in front of a structure like that kind of takes some of the pressure off but also makes you want to raise your game. It can inspire you a bit, so you can kind of play something that goes with this. You're part of some amazing big installation, and I'm just bringing the, the soundscape to that as a DJ. It feels a little bit like that, that the, the stage that is Genesis um, inspires me as a DJ to bring a, a certain kind of performance to it. And people will come just to see the whole structure. So what I do, it's not the main reason people are there, so it gives me a bit more freedom to um, do what I want to artistically. My collective back in Philadelphia has been saying forever that sci-fi is reality, you know? And a large part of my work is also building installation that I perform inside. So it's very important for these themes to be matching each other, you know? To, for these themes to move outside of something that's, you know, corporate sponsored branding all behind you to, you know, an element where you can take your performance to the next level. Really honored to be able to go into these different spaces of the underground and the mainstream uh, audience. That exchange is important. If you care about enriching music and pushing it as far as it can go, then you have to look outside the box. It's a must or, ever, or what's the difference? You're still the same as another festival of just promoting one type of mindset, just promoting the mainstream. You know?
icon, this kind of um, monument, this, this sort of godhead that, character that uh, sort of represents all of humankind and the self simultaneously, kind of locked, entranced into this kind of online digital stare, you know, um, uh, uh, really kind of sums up all of the stuff that we're responding to with the creation of Icon, uh, the sculptural object, the exterior of Icon, uh, the programming, what happens on the stage. Icon has been in development for a number of years, I think probably three years. We've been working on the idea of building something that we could take beyond Glastonbury Festival and we also had been working with Glastonbury on the idea that we would uh, create a new arena in the field directly adjacent to the old Block 9 field. During our sort of early research and development for the project we started talking about a piece of music and investigating the provenance of a piece of music called the Quartet for the End of Time. Uh, by, um, by a French composer called Olivier Mazin. And the circumstances under which that piece of music was created, it was written and first uh, performed in a, in a German prisoner of war camp during the Second World War. He was, he was French and was captured and, and he ended up in this prisoner of war, prisoner of war camp. And the circumstances un, under which that piece of music w was created and what that piece of music sounds like and the structure of it, the fact that it's presented in, in, in eight movements and what each of those movements sort of mean, became the sort of backbone for the creation of Icon. Quartet for the End of Time as a piece of music um, was, uh, its, its name has got a double meaning. Um, you know, you can imagine Messian sat there in his concentration camp, in his prisoner of war camp, you know, these are the end of days, this is the end of time. The title kind of refers to um, literally um, that, Quartet yeah, the, for the end of time. The, the, there's an excerpt from the Book of Revelation that this musical piece is a kind of translation of, of, um, of a set, uh, an excerpt from the Book of Revelation, but it also has this second, um, second uh, meaning as well. The work is widely regarded as uh, one of the first times in, um, in history where Western music really uh, abandoned the, the norms of timekeeping and rhythm. And um, so Quartet for the End of Time kind of refers to the fact that there was a whole bunch of crazy things happening rhythmically, a load of bonkers time signatures. Programming-wise, Icon, we um, kind of cherry-picking artists and thinkers who were kind of doing the same. So while we did have some four to the floor, really banging um, uh, sets, on there, there was a lot of people who were, weren't wor working um, in, in sort of tradi traditional, mm. straight up sort yeah, of house and techno ways. A lot of experimental stuff. More avant-garde kind of end of uh, electronic music. I'm here, no famous. Here, no famous. Let's go. Space invaders, we shoot haters, we shoot haters. Politics in the meanwhile, don't worry, get you later. Space invaders, we fucking hate you, let's go. Space invaders. Space invaders. We fucking hate you. Space invaders, let's go. So pull the pace on pace on. No faith. No faith. What's up? We wanted to make something that was, that spoke of our, the times in which we live. I remember a time before the digital panopticon. I remember not having to walk around with a mobile phone the whole time. That's a significant change to humanity, the presence of all of those things, and the way that they've sort of um, infiltrated our lives. And it's not to say that they're all bad, but I just sort of feel, I think we feel, that human beings have ways of communicating that are very direct. Music is one of those. Art, literature, speaking, the spoken word, direct communications. And the presence of the digital realm means that we have this kind of third party that is constantly filtering the communications between one human being and another human being. And Icon is the sort of antithesis of that. Icon is a moment for people to be in the same space at the same time, 
hearing music directly from performers and in an environment that we're sort of creating that speaks about the digital world. From a music point of view, looking at people growing up now who just see music as um, commodity as entertainment to be consumed, paid for as a service. And it's just terrifying because music is testament to um, the trials and tribulations of humanity and history. The interior uh, part of Icon, which is chapter two, is kind of looking back to a certain extent at, um, at historical examples of the same, the same sort of thing. So it's you know where where musicians have sort of responded to the times in which they live, uh, in which they lived uh, in a in an amazing, powerful, you know way that changed things. We're working on a five-year, uh, five-year sort of program of events uh, with Icon, uh, and we're going to come back to Glastonbury every year in June. So uh, so the Glastonbury shows are the kind of backbone, and that will always only ever be. The, the exterior of Icon, which is perfect for Glastonbury. Mostly at the moment we're, we're aiming to try and take both components together, so the exterior component and the interior immersive show as well. We'll be presenting the, uh, the exterior, so, so an outdoor music arena, but it's an augment, our augmented version of an outdoor music arena, complete with um, CCTV cameras that are feeding directly from the auditorium into the visuals that are projected onto the structure. Live music programmed, um, a broad spectrum of live, live music programmed with AV3D, either in its current format or a reworked version of it. Um, that people can go to visit the site and, 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 and have that um, audio-visual experience as well. Essentially, AV3D um, uh, was kind of like a giant three-dimensional music video on steroids. It features um, video mapping content on the LED screen inside the visor, lasers, 3D sound, bespoke sound, borrowed sound from collaborating artists, quite a large amount of subject matter that the, the project is dealing with is kind of distilled into AV3D visually and sonically. It's not a new way of working for us, but this was our first time actually working together with a large group of amazing people um, from lighting designers, the software and hardware development companies, sound system companies. Some brilliant video people. Some well. brilliant Some video people. people. When people saw the visualization and they heard the sort of concept pitch of what we were trying to do, we just had this amazing uh, sort of swell of support. People saying, well, you know, I know you've got hardly any money for this, but we really want to be involved. Block 9 was founded and NYC Download was founded on a, a group of like-minded people um, wanting to create something from nothing. And, um, and I think that ethos has sort of continued throughout the years. We have a lot of good people working with us um, everything we do is a, is a team effort. There was the will from us to want to do that thing and I think, you know, it's a kind of, you know, it's it sort of, the proof is in the, it, it, it is, is in the, you know, what we've, what we've been able to do from that, from that sort of starting point. You know, if you've got the, 
If you've got the sort of the energy and the and the commitment to do something, it doesn't really matter how much money you've got. So many people pass through the field, and so much talent, and artist management, and different agencies, and you know the world's media. You know Lana Del Rey and Dua Lipa and Banksy and Gorillaz. Um, I think almost all of those guys saw our work in person um, at Glastonbury Festival and, and um, a whole bunch of collaborations often spring up after the, the festival annually. Oh, yeah. 